think about this. I think the most important thing to God about your life is your soul. How many do you have? How many souls do you have? You have one soul. You have one life. Now, I looked up the word soul in my Bible program. It depends upon what version of the Bible you're using as to how many times the word soul appears. If you have an NIV Bible, it'll say about 127 times the word soul. Most of them are found in the Old Testament. If you use the New American Standard Bible like I use, or if you use the Old King James Version, these are the number of times the word soul appears. 276 times in my Bible. And the translators in the Old King James, 458. Your soul should not only be important to you, your soul is important to God. So in the Old Testament, the soul had to do with the total person. It included really a lot of times your body and soul and spirit. <laughs> when you come to the New Testament, however, then we have this uh, three part body, soul, and spirit. That has to do with our purpose statement. <laughs> so I looked up various kinds of uh, words and thoughts that have to do with your soul and my soul. For example, your soul can be in despair. It can weep, it can rejoice, it can love, it can love. All of these words. And there are more. You know that in of the 150 psalms that we have, one pastor said that 113 of them have to do with lament. They have to do with sometimes crying out to God and wailing to God. They don't always have to do with rejoicing. Because we live in a fallen world. Your soul has experienced some of this. The people that you minister to in your church, in their soul, they've experienced a lot of this. Even our Lord Jesus, he says, now is my soul troubled. Your soul can be grieved. Our Lord Jesus wept over Jerusalem before he died on the cross. So the soul can be in any one of these at various times. But your soul then also has various needs. Now, I'd like to share with you that as it relates to the New Testament, as it relates to your Christian life, 
that your soul has to do with your mind, it has to do with your will, it has to do with your emotions. Will and emotions. Jesus had a soul. He had a mind. He felt. So these are some of the needs that you see in the Bible regarding the soul. It has to do with health. Now, here's a question for you personally. Which of these two pictures best represents the state of your soul tonight? <laughs> and your spiritual life. Life is not always a bowl of cherries or a bowl of grapes. Sometimes we go through various desert times. But for our soul, no matter what we go through, God does want us to live a fruitful, healthy life. You see Abel and Swerma's little boy here? Has he been growing? That means he's healthy. Healthy things grow. Unhealthy things do not grow. Healthy churches grow. Not just necessarily numbers, but they grow. Unhealthy churches do not. There could be a lot of people there, but it doesn't mean that the souls of the people are healthy. It doesn't mean that your soul is healthy. Now listen to what John writes in this little postcard, this little letter in 3 John. He says, Beloved, I pray that in all respects you may prosper and be in good health just as your soul prospers. So look, it's God's will for your life and my life, not only that we have health physically, but that our soul prospers. That your mind is healthy. That your will, the decisions that you make, is healthy. That the emotions that you express are good emotions. If I had to ask you about your church, would you say that the souls of the people in your church are healthy? As a pastor, you watch over their souls. Yes. And one day you're going to have to give an account, and I'm going to have to give an account of the souls of the people. Every child that you have in your feeding project has a soul. And we are to nurture that soul. We feed them physically. But we are to help them to have a healthy mind and to make good decisions and to express godly emotions. 
John is writing to people he loves. We're going to be talking about 40 days of love. If you don't, if, if you don't love the souls of your people, may I say it very kindly, please get out of the ministry. <laughs> if you don't care about the children, please stop feeding children. <laughs> Paul writes to a church that he started and he was only there three weeks. And he writes back to them. At the end of his first letter, he writes these words. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you entirely. You know what the word sanctify means? What? Set apart. Entirely. Not just a little bit. And may your spirit and soul and body be preserved complete. Paul was concerned about the church in Thessalonica, about their body, their soul, and their spirit. Because you see, there was false teaching going around. It's the spirit that matters. You can live any way you want in the body, that doesn't matter. You can indulge in the desires of the flesh. And end of the mind. And Paul says, no way. God's will for your life, for your children's lives, for the people in your church, is that they preserve body, soul, and spirit. Notice, without blame, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now here's the good news. Faithful is he who calls you, and he also will bring it to pass. You cannot take care of your body and soul and spirit all by yourself. You'll mess up. You need divine enablement. Amen. And so when we talk in the Old Testament about the soul, it most often included the spirit. And the spirit is going to live forever. When I die, I'm 71 and a half. One of these days, I will take my last breath and my last heartbeat. And they will bury me. My body will be there. But I will bury me. be there. My mind will be gone. I won't be making any decisions in my will. I won't be saying, I want to get out of here. I won't be having any emotions. But my spirit will be with Jesus. Mm. And one day when he returns, I get a new body. And that's all who believe. So as you minister to children, as you minister in your church, Faithful is he who calls you and calls them, and he is at work in their lives. 
Now look at these verses. Now Peter is writing. John is concerned about the soul. Paul is concerned about the soul. Peter is concerned about the soul. That means that God's concerned about your soul and my soul. Now notice what he says. Since you have an obedience to the truth, purified your souls. You see, a soul can be impure or pure. You only have a purified soul as you walk in obedience. If your people are not walking in disobedience or in obedience, their souls are not purified. And remember, this is being purified for sincere, that means real and authentic love of the brethren. That's what we're going to be talking about, six sessions. Love. Now notice, you've been born again, not of seed which is perishable, but imperishable, that is, through the living and enduring or abiding word of God. I'm going to be sharing with you about seven different laws of the harvest. You know what this is? Hello. It's a magazine. <laughs> These are academia nuts. They are growing to be here. So that's why I was asking. They've been sitting, they've been sitting in this yogurt container for two years. And they will continue to sit here. Unless I take one and I plant it. Now this shell is hard. And it'll remain alone. But there is potential in here. If you plant this in good soil, with good moisture, and good sunlight, it'll produce someday a macadamia tree. So we're going to be talking about seven different laws of the harvest as it relates to your life, your married life, your family life, your church life. Now notice what Peter goes on to say in the second chapter. Abstain from fleshly lust that wage war against the soul. Do you ever feel the battle within? The very thing you don't want to do, you do. It's, it's called a war. It's an internal war. Fleshly lust, my own desires, what I want. They wage war against my body, against my mind, my will, and emotions. And so we're involved in a battle. And so we need to trust the faithful one. And we need an obedience to the truth to purify our souls. So this conference, I've called it living a healthy, fruitful life and leaving a godly legacy. Now, 
I would suggest that all of you want to be healthy physically. You don't want to be sick. But we also don't want to be sick in our souls. We want to live a life that produces some fruit. And when we die, and we will, we want to live a godly legacy. Not just have physical children, but spiritual children. Spiritual adults. Does that sound good to you? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Living a healthy life, fruitful life, and leaving behind when you die a legacy? Yeah. So the reason that we're focused on your marriage and on your family and on your church and for and love <coughs> Because if there's no love, there's no health. If there's no love in a family, your family's not healthy. They may be healthy physically, but I'll tell you, they're not healthy in their soul. So we're going to be talking about living a life of love. Now, as we begin, I'm going to go over some things very, very quickly because I want to just remind you of why we exist as churches. Some of you have been in a seminar that I've done or some kind of conference that I've done. And I've shared before that church health produces church growth. If a person is not healthy, there won't be any growth. If the church is not healthy, the church will not grow. I have a friend. His name is Chip Ingram. Chip Ingram. We did a pastor's conference here about four years ago for about 300 pastors at EFZ. Were any of you there? The River of Life Eastley. Yeah. Pastor Bernard was the only one that was there. Chip has written about 12 books. He has about 12 DVD series that have to do with the book. And uh, his, this book here that he has, his church, is a church of about 3,000 people. He's one of my best friends. It's very close to where I live. It's all based upon Romans chapter 12. Because in Romans chapter 12, Paul goes through and he talks about what church health should be. Churches grow stronger through worship. And worship here in the context in Romans 12.1 is not singing and praising and dancing. It has to do with the worship of giving God your body. That's worship. Churches grow deeper through discipleship. If you want a tree to stand against the wind, the roots have to go down. If there's no roots, there's not going to be any growth. It's going to fall over. 
So you need to disciple your people. That's what we're to do is to make disciples. Churches grow wider through ministry. Paul says in Romans chapter 12 that every single person that's born again has a spiritual gift and we're to exercise those gifts. Churches grow warmer through fellowship and love. Paul says in Romans chapter 12, love one another from the heart. And churches grow greater through evangelism. These are the five purposes of the church. If you were to read this book that Rick Warren had, he would say that these are the five purposes of the church. What if you eliminate two or three of those? You may have a gathering, but you don't have a church that's healthy. You may make a lot of noise and shout and dance around and work up a sweat. And dance around and work up a sweat. But that doesn't mean that God is worshipped and praised and adored. And so from Romans chapter 12, these are the five different things that uh, oh, I've been teaching for years and years. These are 12 commitments that I've tried to make and implement in my life. It's to present the body or presenting the body. It's to renew the mind. It's exercising spiritual gifts. It's loving the brethren. Uh, it's spelled wrong. Spelling in Babaji And it's blessing your enemies. We are putting the rope of fads in the ground. You're to bless your enemies. It's not about the rope of fads in the ground. You're not to judge them. We're not to go and go to go. You're not to take vengeance on them. We're not to go to go to go. Vengeance is God's. Go to go to go to go. He repays. You don't go to go. So healthy churches grow. Just like healthy churches. Children grow. So growth comes from health. Does that make sense to you? Yes. It makes sense to God.